because everything looks good on our end. Mm, yeah, yeah. Good evening, everybody. We are live and getting ready to rock and roll this evening for another bird dog chat with Ethan and Kat. And we're not late because we aren't having any technical difficulties now currently, we, we considering we had a lot to set up and make sure that this was going to work tonight, because guess what, guys? You're going to get to see some puppies. There we go. Nice. Almost no technical difficulties. All right. So are anybody that's already pulled their uh, bingo card, I've got to do a quick select and delete. <laughs> so get a new card. Get a new card, folks. Get a new card. And there it is. Somebody just pulled a new card. Anybody doesn't know what we're talking about specifically, we have um, Bird Dog Chat Bingo. And what that involves is you get to play a game if you're a patron. Uh, what is a patron, you may be asking? Hmm. <sighs> Where do I start? Um, Patreon's a different social platform. Okay, you've uh, probably familiar with Facebook or Instagram. Essentially, Patreon is a private platform that allows you to sign up with a subscription service. There's a couple different tiers that we have set up. First and foremost, we have the buy us a beer on live chat night. That's $5 a month. It's just to say... Thanks. High five. We love you. And okay. it gets you access to the Bird Dog Bingo cards every week. Yeah, what are we going to give away tonight? You think on that for a second. Okay. Next, we have um, a couple other tiers, and these are all us helping you tiers, okay? Um, $35 a month gets you Q&A as well as video exchange. Um, there's a private chat section that we can help guide you through your dog training adventure. Let's go with that. Then you have the top two tiers, which are step-by-step -step training programs, okay? Essentially, we're going to evaluate where you're at, what your dog is, and what your dog needs. Pretty cool stuff, okay? Um, those are $200 and $350, respectively, and you get weekly or bi-weekly check-ins with myself. We'll go over where you're at. I'll be there to help you during troubly, troubling, troubled, trouble. Tough sessions. There we go. And then um, all, all in all, we're able to help you progress through training and do the best that you can doing it from home. So, Patreon. If you need help from us, it's the most powerful tool that we have, as well as we want to give a quick thank you to patrons. Um, it's also the largest supporter of all of the things that we do online. So, thank you, patrons. Now, let's do a couple quick check-ins. Rolling with the check-ins, we've got Melanie Carlson from Don and Melanie in Minnesota. You passed Godelope. I didn't think that was a place. Oh, come on. Godelope, New Mexico. I missed that one. Sorry. Idaho in the house. Massachusetts, Long Beach, California. What else we got here? It just jumped all the way to the bottom or something crazy on me. Um, Nashville with Remington. We've got... Stony Creek, New York. Hey, Angelo. Um, Alberta, Canada. Hey, Kaylin. Wisconsin, River Edge, New Jersey. Alabama, Indiana. Meeker, Oklahoma. Hutchinson. K. I'm assuming Hutchinson, Kansas. Whoop, whoop, in the house. Uh, Clinton, TWP, Michigan. <laughs> Diane Hill. I wonder We're going to have to stalk you. I wonder if I talked to Diane Hill just a little bit ago. We got Mac, Kelly, and Jackson ice. from New Jersey. Where oh, I just, it just, it keeps doing that. It jumps on me. Lake Bay, was Washington, Washington. Uh, hi from the UK. Our first international check in. No, there was a Canada one. We've got some international check ins oh, here. Canada. <laughs> checking in from this uh, somewhere in the middle of Kansas, Annie, coming back from Colorado. Hope you got oh your passport. Canada. California. Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. Piedmont, South Dakota. Woodland, Texas. Western Colorado. Prairie Sunrise Kennel in South Dakota. 
Planada. Planada. Speaking of South Dakota, we're going to be there here Planada, shortly. Planada, California. Plan Planada. Um, and <coughs> eagle rare. <coughs> that didn't really sound like an eagle. Nice try, honey. Northern Michigan, <coughs> Chicago, checking in. Uh, what else we got? Florida. Oh. Ooh, that's Cheney, Washington, good. Minnesota, and somebody said Bourbon Time. That's right. So if you guys are new to our live stream or if you've been following along, you will know that we typically have a few drinks, talk a little talk, answer some questions, but the questions come in towards the end. And tonight, okay, tell, tell them about no, your No, no, bourbon. no, 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 no. I'm not interrupting at all. And tonight we've got a special treat for you guys because we talked about showing you the two litters of puppies that we have on the ground that this is the first time in Standing Stone history that we have had two litters born on the exact same day. One is a short hair litter. One is a lab litter from Lone Duck Outfitters. And we have these two puppies, two litters of puppies that are both five weeks old today. This is their five week birthday. And we are going to be showing you them playing together on this thingy. Uh, right now, I believe they are just sleeping together. I know. Mm. I think we did another live chat one time and did this, and it's like n nappy nap time at this time. So uh, I want to make sure that we set up before the next is uh, we could got a microphone. We've got uh, Boss Charlie over here. Um, we can get a microphone swung over that way so we can hear you. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, so um, this is an interesting one because Eagle Rare is actually a – small batch whiskey but this specifically is a single barrel select so technically anybody that's playing this would be single barrel bourbon <laughs> i don't have anything else to say <laughs> that was kind of a letdown hmm? ah it's different than normal ingle ingle inglewood Mm -mm. Different than normal Eagle Rare because it's uh, tastier ish. Depending on what kind of tastiers you like. The biggest thing with this is it's a unique barrel, right? That's a single barrel. Small batches are mixture barrels to try and have a similar taste ish. Um, what would it be like uh, if you look at just a. Are they all considered, they're not considered small, it's just like Jim Bean in a bottle. It's not small batch. Is it small batch? It's just, a, it's a blend. Yeah, so they take over, there's a guy, specific job is to make Jim Bean taste like Jim Bean, and he has to taste these things and mix these things, and that's how you bottle it. So um, this is not that way. You could get a good bottle, you could get a bad bottle. <laughs> Charles, how was the Invitational missed the last week? Well, Miss Kelly, you're going to have to go back and listen to our talk on Navda because that was that week, the week that we talked about um, Charles being gone at the Invitational, but also all the different little tidbits about the different levels of testing in Navda, which was, I thought, pretty interesting. So hopefully you'll get a chance to go back and listen to it at some point in time. So, uh, finish, we, we jumped around with what is Patreon and everything else. Yeah, well, well we talked about that, and then we kind of talked about we're going to be doing Bird Dog Bingo, so if you haven't got your bingo card, go to patreon.com slash standingstonekennels, and you can get your bingo card that we do quirky stuff, and Miss Kelly actually um, recognized how much quirky we stuff we do on a regular basis and created a, the original bingo cards, and we have uh, kind of added to it since then, and... I think there's going to be some new options added it's soon. It's coming as soon as I send her the, the list to yeah. add it. And then um, if you guys get a bingo, we give away some cool stuff. Last week we gave away some merch. We've given away, given away dog food. I'm not sure. We'll decide what we're giving away this week. It'll be something great. Uh, we gave away a bark collar last week, I think, from DT Systems, the mm. Bark Boss. Mm. Was Or no, the week before. Bark Boss. What? Yeah, Kelly won. The week before. So it was the week before. I know. I'm yeah. Oh, yeah. Charlie, did you pass at the Invitational? Wah, he wah, did wah. not. Mako Tough did day. not. Yep. Tough day. She but said, Doc Searchy is more fun than Blind Retrievee. That'll happen. 
Um, but if you guys have a question that's just burning a hole in your pocket, the way that we're going to be able to get to those um, and give those priority is if you guys do super chats with them. Um, and we typically talk about something leading up to that. And tonight we're going to be talking about puppies, puppies, puppies. And more puppies, because you're looking at puppies, so why not talk about them? Not yet, but show the puppies! Da -da -da. Look they, how boring that is. They are really boring right now. Come on, somebody go poke them or something. Oh, stretch. Big stretch. That Aww. is what a pile of 15 short hair lab puppies looks like. Now, that isn't a um, lab short hair litter. It's a short hair litter and a lab litter combined as one. We've got the Jane Gunner litter, which is the all um, short hair puppies in there. And then we've got the Sam and Chaos litter from Lone Duck, which is the lab puppies in that pile. Um, I had a question. Charlie, you got the ability to share your computer screen? All right. Before we're done, so we've got some really exciting news that's burning a hole in Cat's pocket. And I know that it's also burning a hole in my pocket because I'm really excited for the amount of insane amount of work that she's put into this already. But um, so this is something that we've talked about, hinted at, communicated, communicadoed about for a very long time. And that is the step-by-step -step, true, like follow a course of things program. Yeah, and we have had obviously our YouTube channel. Thank you guys for subscribing, following along selecting notifications, all those fun things. Um, and we've created a ton of videos and have an insane library of videos. But like people have mentioned over and over, they kind of get lost in the direction that they're supposed to be following these videos. It kind of is, you get sucked down a rabbit hole. We do have playlists, so they actually show, you know, like step one through step whatever in the playlist, but it is still hard to follow those at times. Um, so we have definitely seen a need for creating a step-by-step -step training program for basically eight-week-old puppies through a year-old puppies. And um, every once in a while, people reach out to us and say, hey, I've been trying to follow your videos. You know, I've got a 16-week-old puppy, or I just rescued a dog, and I'm trying to follow along. Where should I start? And that was one thing that this training program that we've created is definitely uh, set up to be, you bring your puppy home at eight weeks, you follow this plan until they're a year old. Now, could you follow that with an older dog? 100% absolutely. And you would just follow the same steps and you may jump ahead a little bit because you're working through things faster because let's face it, a six month old dog has a much stronger attention span and learning ability than a little eight week old puppy. So um, sometimes, sometimes, and then sometimes, you know, your eight week old puppy is a really nice blank slate that you're getting to work with. Whereas your older dog that maybe is a rescue or comes with some baggage has issues that you're working through. And that's when you, you know, maybe need the extra help that Patreon can provide or signing up for the video consults that will be available in our online course. So this all started well, Ethan was gone at game fair. And uh, I was I know. and I was at home with nothing to do other than whelp puppies and take care of litters. So I might as well start outlining this training program. And Ethan and I were kind of talking about it while he was traveling and I was working on stuff. And it really felt more of not you go from this step to this step to this step, but more you go through these steps. And what I mean by that is I'm going to just show you guys, which I don't know if I'll be able to tell if I'm showing the camera this. Oh, you'll be able to. How will I know? Are you going to flip this up so that it pulls off of our computer? What am I going to do? Do I have it on my phone? Uh, I can get it on. I can get it on my phone, I think. Oh, we're we're gonna get savvy here. Let me let me pull this up here for just a minute. I don't really know how to get there. Isn't that cable awesome? You should see this cable. It's an it's HDMI really cable. Thick. <laughs> That's what she said. Standard standard <laughs> size of a of a. I'm not. We're just going on here. You're stop, stop now. Oh, I'm getting a reach under. <laughs> okay. Plug this sucker uh, in here. Now, if I plug this in, is it going to immediately show what's on my... 
Is it going to go ping pong in the center of the thing, though? Yeah. Cool. It says accessory. Will not function until the download completes. Okay. So, because I... How did I... Um, one little fun tidbit here. These are um, American labs. America. Just like the old Eagle Rare here. This cord is... <laughs> America. It's a very stiff cord. <laughs> I'm like trying to make it curve or something. <laughs> uh, stop. Okay. Just, I'm, hold on. I got to find the first page. No, but um, anybody that is interested, there may be one female puppy left. I don't know for sure. Who you want to reach out to is Lone Duck. It's Bob Owens, Lone Duck. Can we throw maybe, like, his direct cell phone number in there? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he'd love just it. Just for on the live stream, do you have his cell phone number? Just, no, just uh, Lone Duck Outfitters. And I think his number might even be on the website, but. Lone, the Lone D. They have a Instagram. They have a YouTube channel and some really interesting videos. So if you do have a lab. Um, if you're watching my videos, my videos are technically a secondhand reproduction of the real stuff, okay? Uh, I just watch one of Bob's videos and then do it and create a video for y'all. How do I make this so that it fits on? Oh, Americans have narrow there we heads. Oh, okay. It didn't. Oh, it did now. It did now. <laughs> Get your mind out of the gutter. My mind only has one place, Kelly. The gutter is where it lives. Okay, Charles, <sighs> ready to roll, I think. Is it? But it's not showing on my phone. We're looking at Lone Duck on the YouTubes. Oh. Yeah, it's, uh, here, you're looking at, th there's a slight delay. Oh, there's a delay. Guys, there's so a delay. It's not slight, instantaneous. Okay. Slight delay. I'm just so used to that instant gratification. Amazon Prime, get me here today. Mm. Which, speaking of which, our Standing Stone supply is dang fast and has competed with some of the major suppliers as well as the Amazon, people have told us. In so. case you didn't know, StandingStoneSupply.com is our supply store where we provide everything that we use and recommend for dog training. We're continually adding to that as I can get more things, like one of the most recent here, the Alpha 209 Primer Pistols. Those are what we've been using for years and years and years. I bought one of the crappy whatever Primer Pistols and broke it in the first couple months and then went, it's fine, I'm going to pony up and get an Alpha. Uh, and I have literally been using the same one for 10 years. Bought a second one and went, wow. It's still also as good as the first. Um, I did have one little hiccup with it, but they have a limited lifetime warranty, and they fixed it, sent it back to them. So it cost me shipping to get the one unit, the original gangster, um, repaired. Something silly. It was like a one little pen piece broke. Something, something. They fixed it. Long story short. Um, we've got all the stuff. If you see something we don't have, uh, we would love to add it. If it's something that we use and recommend, key thing there being, you can call and ask. We can tell you how they work. Someone asked uh, about Tacticam. Yeah, we utilize the Tacticam stuff when I do barrel-mounted things, so it's uh, it's kind of fun. Hold on. You're getting there. I'm getting there. So, um, quick sidebar that's... It's okay. Oh, this is a real quick sidebar. Oh, do it, do it. Okay, so four four of my birds activated at the Hoosier Classic. Um, started with a slightly larger team than that, but not drastically larger. Uh, they finished top 25% in the 100-mile activation. So it means we're on to the big, the big shows, brah. Do you guys remember that, like, TikTok that was viral for a really long time, that it was like... <laughs> That's what I hear when my husband talks about pigeons. That's what you're going to be saying exactly. when I bring home the big dough, baby. Prove I pull, it. I pull out a half a million dollar win in this race. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I. you pretty much have told me what you're going to do with that. Build a new loft. Okay, so go back to my phone or whatever. Okay, thanks, Charles. So... This is the outland I created while Ethan was at Game Fair um, with a little bit of his 
you know, help to be like, hey, should this come before this? Or how do you guys think, you know, how much time should we spend on this? Because strangely enough, when Ethan and I train puppies and dogs, it kind of just flows and happens. But I don't always think about the exact timing of, well, how long did I spend on that? Well, I spent as much time on it as it took. So um, this took a lot of actual, like, deep thought processes. So this is, like I mentioned, the outline. And we have each of these sections of training broken out into three categories, three columns that you kind of work on simultaneously. And like I said, this is the outline. So this was what I wanted to include in the training course and the videos that I wanted to utilize. Kelly just said cat get goats. I'm sure there's some kind of competition. Yes, there is, Kelly. It's called eating competitions. We are not eating the goats. Or do you mean the goats eat things? No. Which did you we mean? G meat goats. Come on now. No, 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 no. But right. then, so then you kind of can go through, and I'm just going to kind of briefly scroll through. It's not like you guys have to memorize this, because there is going to be a course available. But so you can see, it's all broken out through weeks of training, approximate ages that you're going to be doing that training, and the length of time you're going to be spending on each of these lessons. And I broke down the lessons um, into 11 lessons, and some of the lessons range from one week of time that you're going to be spending on that lesson to up to eight weeks of time that you're going to be spending on those lessons uh, when you get into the train to treat process. So I, like I said, um, put that together with a little bit of Ethan's input, not saying that he wasn't helpful, but just saying that I did most of the work. Nah, I did <laughs> nothing. <laughs> okay, I got to figure out how to get like to this. I'm just a pretty da, face. Da, da, da. So I wanted to just show you guys once I get it. Why is this thing? Uh, Pages. I don't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. GDIYs in the house. Ooh. They just went on an absolutely fantastic sounding trip. I got to be part of the beginning stages of it by a quick phone call and forcing them to drive all the way through the night to make it to the <laughs> random farmhouse that I was staying at in the middle of South Dakota. But they we killed a couple birds. We talked birds. about that last week. I know, but we? he's actually here. They, he, it, whatever you identify as. What? <laughs> is it Nick? Okay. So um, the cool thing, though, is with that specifically is I'm waiting for the podcast to come out, if it hasn't already, about the trip itself. Because I'm sure there's one or two stories based on how y'all <laughs> were packed in that truck. There's some stories there. Okay, Charles, you can go to this. So this is kind of the overview of what the course is going to look like on the s website. So and That's sexy. What? Mm. Week one of training. Mm. You're going to spend a week on it. This I is love how you have this broken down. Go back, 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 back. You have uh, duration, right? How long is this sh approximately going to be lasting? This lesson, right? Then go down. Keep scrolling. We're not reading all this. We're just looking <laughs> at the, the way you have it laid out. Obedience goal. Stop scrolling so fast. Oh my gosh, you're like, we're not reading it. Scroll. We no, are reading we're it. We're looking at the subtitles, sweetheart. Oh. Oh, so, obedience. obedience goals, developmental goals, and then complementary goals. That's those three categories broken down into all of the things that you should be working on at the same time. That's an interesting thing because most training plans that I've seen are a linear path. Right. Yeah, and that's this thing that we were struggling with, with like, this even is not creating a this process and having some kind of format to create it in. Mm -hmm. So it was all built out. So this just kind of gives you an overview of the obedience goals you're going to be working with. Oh yeah, charging the clicker. Big surprise there, people. And then you're going to be working on developmental goals, and there is a lot of stuff in there. When and you then first get your puppy, woo, there's a lot of information. Lots of stuff. This is not <sighs> jipping you at all. And then, okay, so then I wanted to go back. This is going to take a second, Charles, to be really sneaky. Throw those puppies up for a second. See if those little turds are still sleeping. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Still sleeping. Uh, quick question here. It says, can I use this with my deer tracking dog? No. Oh, this training program? Yeah, I mean, you can use you can. some the of it, but portion. it is definitely based on an upland hunting dog's progressions. But there's a lot in the basic beginnings that is very similar. So, Oh, uh, whoa, whoa. This is, a, this is a correction here. It says, first place pigeon at the Hoosier, Hoosier Classic Auction was a $7,000 bid. 
No, no, no. It went for seventy thousand. Sixty seven five. That's what the first place bird went for last year. Continue. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. So I wanna just show this uh, yep, I'm kinda ready. It is it it won't quite fit the screen. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. But I created these sample weekly routines for people to follow as well. Even more information. Yeah, so you can break it down for your a.m., noon, and p.m. schedules with your puppy. And again, like we're talking about, we're talking about routines, not set schedules. These are not like, hey, at 6 a.m., you got to do this. This is, hey, you should be including these things throughout your day. And we've got Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And I created these sample weekly routines for all of the lessons throughout the <laughs> training can course. Where find this lesson plan? Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to be very soon. Obviously, you can see that we've got a lot of this put together. Um, uh, you can see on my Google, my Google Docs, look at all those sample weekly plans laid out for you people. we got a daily activity log. We've got daily activity uh, logs are going to be really important. This is something that I talk about with all um, aspiring dog trainers. And it's interesting because it's one of those do what I say, not what I do kind of things. My brain works differently. I don't journal. I don't log. But one of the re most recommended things to do from a training standpoint is to, especially if you're not familiar with the process, to journal or log what is happening every day. And that's going to help you to keep better track of where you're struggling, where you're excelling, and what are the things that specifically happened within those days or within those training sessions or within whatever that you can start to piece together. How do we help our dog be successful moving forward? As well as it allows you to recognize patterns that are happening. So if your puppy is constantly having a potty accident before you get an opportunity to let them out every day at certain times, hey, that lets you recognize I probably should shorten the amount of crate time they're getting or I should make sure that they're getting an extra opportunity to potty. Just things like that that you can recognize so that you can set your puppy up for success um, is really important to be intentional and aware with what you're doing with your puppy and training. So, um, And then this is the overall training goals checklist that you can follow along and keep track of your progress throughout the process. Um, and you've got your week one, and again, broken into those three quadrants of training goals. And it goes all the way through. These are things that you should be accomplishing with your puppy as you go. Ha ha. Whoops. <laughs> so, I can't give it all away. I've worked my butt off putting no, this together. So, <laughs> this is something that will be available very soon. We've been... We've been trying to set deadlines for ourselves to push it out faster. And then we'd hit a wall from a developmental standpoint on how do we put this together properly? Well, we're finally there. We're finally putting the pieces together. It will be available as a private section, basically within standing some supplies a members website. Only section, yep, members yeah. only. So you sign up, you pay the fee. Ooh, we've got some. Oh, and it's over. Um, <laughs> puppies come we, on hey, 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 we've a members only area on standing supply.com and in that portion once you sign up you get the opportunity to have access as well as all of the updates forever which is going to be cool because right now we've got the, the videos that are there we will be updating always adding to changing out making it better yeah and um this creation has really made me excited uh, about teaching. I mean, I went to school to be a teacher, if you didn't know. So I have that love what? for educating people, um, educating dogs, that sort of thing. And uh, we have a lot of experience to share. And we have gotten so many questions about raising and whelping litters as well, which falls right into talking about puppies and obviously these two cute litters that are on the ground now. And so I'm going to create a course on raising and whelping litters as well so that if people are raising their first litter, have questions, things like that, they have documentation, they have resources, they have a step-by-step -step plan, what they should be doing when it doesn't go right and it goes wrong, what you can be doing um, to help mamas, to help puppies, things like that. So that is going to be my next course that I am putting together. Um, so 
goal for the new year is to get that one rolling. Um, but these definitely are a labor of love, and they are <laughs> time intensive. Flip to those puppies. Are they on? Oh, nice. I can't tell what's showing up. So anything else you want to talk about puppies, or would you like to roll into answering some people's questions? Yeah, question answering sounds like fun. Let's see. <laughs> Who one is it? puppy. Which one is it? Is it a labr labradoodle? Mm, Black wah, or wah, yellow? Wah. Black. Black. <laughs> You've got like a 90% chance that that's a female. Yeah. There's only one black male. Mm. What? Nah. And peed. Hey, they are only Clean five up on weeks. They are only five weeks Clean old. Clean up on aisle three. <laughs> no. Let's see. Oh, yeah. And maybe some poops because they're puppies and they are learning. No, let me type it. You suck at typing. I do suck at typing. All right. So the because I'm we're put up a poll. This is an interesting part. We want to somebody ask how much the program will cost. And that is a question that we do not yet know the answer to. So we're going to put up a little poll and just in a value standpoint, based on the, you know, weekly routines, the, the worksheets, the step-by-step -step instructions showing from, you just, I did it wrong. You, yes or no. How much <laughs> should the program cost? Yes or no. Oh, uh, and the poll. Yes. Hey, I did the typing. That was all I was good for. Uh, um, or something. <laughs> Zero percent said yes. Oh, damn it. Okay. Redo. Use your typing portion. You're all just right. using my typing. I get it. Add yeah. option. So we have to, oh, we have to, can't, they can't just. I mean, they could. Oh, oh they gotcha, could. gotcha. I didn't know if, I thought that they could just type. Oh my gosh. What? Okay. Asking the community now. Now that we actually have options because I didn't realize it was a yes or no <laughs> I didn't realize I was asking a yes or no question. Um All right, perfect. All right. So uh this is cool. So can we answer no, no pee pads? pads. So Aha. So there are. Those pads that have the little puppy prints on them are actually super absorbent and um, are quilted and they do absorb a lot of potty if it happens um, but also are a little more resilient than pee pads because the puppies get into feisty shake it up kill it phases and then would just destroy those pee pads yeah now this is an interesting thing too at the same time these puppies are uh, it is definitely not an Austin Powers reference. And if you think it's an Austin Powers reference, you can't use it as a reference to a movie or something else. Why okay? not? That 100% is. Not if you think it's an Austin Powers reference. Come on now. Oh, what is it? Cat has no idea. That's I don't okay. watch those movies. They're so dumb. <laughs> so dumb. You're 25% you're of the way there to name in the movie, huh? Dumb and dumber. <laughs> <laughs> also, never seen it because it's so dumb. The name of the movie itself is yeah, dumb. <laughs> I love it. So, some interesting things about how we actually raise and develop puppies. These guys here are in the stage of potty training. They get these play corrals, which is kind of a fun thing. And not many people know, which is why we're going to be doing some stuff, okay, um, to show more about this process as well as putting a course together because there's a lot of people out there trying to raise puppies at home and want to know how we're doing it. They're in the stage now where they're actually starting potty training. So though, although there will be accidents, they're going out all day and all night, basically. We have an air out pin specifically for them, kept separate from everything else. The only thing that goes in there is mamas and puppies, okay? So they get to go out every approximately... One to two hours, depending on the time of day. Yes, folks, I understand that is a lot of labor. 
with a approximately three hour break in the middle of the afternoon ish. Yep. Ish. So, um, but then they will actually move to utilizing some crate training as well in there. But all of that being to help them to understand that outside is the primary place of potty, making it drastically easier going home. So, and we start a big part of that process of learning to go out to potty as soon as they get up in the morning. First thing is get outside. So they go from their whelping box to outside because first thing that they do when they wake up is need to go potty. The other time is after they eat. So we feed the puppies, doing the puppy mush weaning weaning thing, and then as soon as they get their meals, outside to go potty because what goes into a little puppy very quickly comes out of the puppy. So we can start teaching them these valuable behaviors of, hey, we go potty outside, not in our inside clean play space. 100%. Do we have any question questions in here? I think Kelly asked right here. Hunting for grouse this weekend, first time. Congratulations, that's awesome. Three hunters, four dogs. The dogs haven't been together before this weekend. Thoughts for them to hunt together, introducing. This is a great question, okay? So first and foremost, I'm going to pick, okay, the average male dog owner. Owner of a male dog. Male dog owner works, eh? Sure. Yeah. Okay, so um, typically they don't have a good handle, especially if the dogs are intact. And this is it's 100% poking. So if you have an intact male dog, I'm going to list a couple of things here. And if you check any of these boxes, you fall into the same category. So understand that this is a loving comment, but also an honest one. Running around, peeing on everybody's truck and tires and guns and legs and all of those things that are quote-unquote funny and male things. Also, dogs running up and greeting other dogs by having hackles raised and puffed chests and just being uh, abrupt in the way that they have to interact. It's a run-up to say, who are you and why are you hunting with me? Okay. Um, The best way to go kind of about the actual dog aspect of things is probably to look more into if everybody has their dogs under control, they shouldn't be paying attention to anybody. And that would be the way that my dog, personal dogs, would interact. If you came and hunted with me, they would be with me healing or whatever. I would send them off to hunt, and they would pay zero attention to your dog. None of the dogs need to come meet or sniff each other's butts or do any of those things. It's not necessary. The more emphasis that we put on that, the more emphasis that's put on the dogs controlling some kind of interaction type thing that can ultimately lead to somebody feeling uncomfortable, somebody pushing more than they should, and then somebody getting grumpy with somebody else. Lots of somebody's there. But as far as the dog introductions go, it's one of those things that can be a problem. So Kelly, with your dog specifically, I would definitely keep old Jackson on lead and help him to be focused on moving forward into the hunting category. After things happen, um, some of the big ones that are going to come up are bird stealing, which grouse hunting, I would assume rough, r- roughed grouse, rough grouse, um, is going to be the big thing that you're doing based on where you're at in the world. And uh, unless you get into a good number of woodcock, the number of dead grouse on the ground will probably be l- limited-ish. So there shouldn't be a ton of opportunities um, for you hunting. I would just say make sure that you have a good handle on where is at. Extra dogs are going to pull each other out. Typically, they feed off of each other a bit. And then when you get into that zone, it's easy to get for dogs to get turned around. So those would be my bigs for what you're explaining you're going into. Also, have fun. And trees are 70% air. So swing and pull the trigger. <laughs> that's, the only, I mean, it's the, it's that, that's it. Um, ammo is the cheapest part of the hunt, no matter how much you shoot. Unless you go to Argentina, then it can be one of the most expensive parts of the hunt. Because you shoot a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. this is a good question from, and I'm going to, mispronounce your name and I apologize. No, you're not. You're going to get this. Vuk Rajkovic. Rajkovic? Rajkovic. I'm going with that one. Hello from Montenegro. 
Southeast Europe. I have a two-year-old GSP who living indoor our house. We have a big problem. He always runs away down the street and walking for three hours around the hood. He don't recall. So. Gotcha. That is a big problem. I completely understand what you're talking about. So. Um, collar conditioning for recall is going to be very valuable for you. That allows you to recall the dog, even if they want to sniff and explore and run away. Um, you have to do the collar conditioning for recall properly. You start with positive reinforcement based training, clicker training for that recall behavior. And then you're able to transition to collar conditioning that behavior. Um, something else that you can work on is impulse control and door manners so that your dog doesn't bust through the door to escape. Um, another option is place training. So when you have to be going in and out of the door so that your dog isn't, you know, crowding the door and testing the limits of escaping, you can ask them to get on their dog bed. You can call or condition them to get on their dog bed, and then they can stay there while you are working on, you know, going in and out of your front door so that they're not escaping that way. Um, that would be my biggest recommendations is working on Collar conditioning for recall, collar conditioning for place training, and that impulse control. We have lots of communication back and forth about the difference between British and English labs, and I'm going to tell you, I don't know the difference. So We're not the lab people. We're just know. raising the litter. I don't know. What uh, did that say? Something about... Watching oh. lots of your videos? Yep. Sorry, I thought it was a question at first. Uh-uh. Robert? Gallon Noto. <laughs> I'm going with it. Say it with authority, and it sounds right. It sounded very questioned as it came out of your mouth. <laughs> okay. Well, I meant to say it with authority. <laughs> Confidence. Try, try it again. Try it again. Robert Gallon Noto. Less questionable. Yeah, it sounded better. Thank you. Is he giggling <laughs> over there? He's giggling. <laughs> Little boy's tickling Aiden's himself. Aiden's watching a little YouTube while mommy and daddy are live streaming it because it's a little before his bedtime. So he is tickling himself over there with whatever he's watching on YouTube Kids. It says here, um, hey, guys, I talked with Ethan at Game Fair on the first Friday. I got a new puppy in March, used Cat's technique to put it next to me at night in the crate. Worked like a charm. Thanks. Awesome. Hey, thanks for being here, Brad. It's great to meet you. Okay, here's a good question from Chris Amundsen. Got my first pointing dog, a Drothar. How do you know when to shoot when starting the field training? Already gun introduced and bird introduced. Okay, I don't know the question. I lost myself. I thought you were going to ask about how to again. do gunfire, but it sounds like the dog has already had a gunfire introduction and a bird introduction. So how do you know when to shoot when starting uh, pointing birds? Well... Where in the process do you start? When are you ready to start shooting birds if the dog already has a bird and gunfire introduction? So you should only be shooting the birds that your dog actually points when you yes. get to that so point. Our typical progression would be we try and develop pointing naturally, which is going to be important for your draught. If it really is a draught, um, typically the German lines tend to have a little more prey drive, and that prey drive can be misdirected sometimes. So... Developing natural pointing instinct may be a smidge of a challenge, not always, but sometimes. And what we typically are doing is developing natural pointing instinct using electronic launchers because we can control when the bird comes out of them. We use pigeons. Homing pigeons are a renewable resource for us. If you set that up, it can be pretty cool for you too. Um, and if not, use feral pigeons. They're going to be cheaper than about any other game bird. If you can't get a hold of them, Use whatever game bird that will fly away. Key thing here. Will fly away. And the thing is, even if you've got a chuck, and I just want to throw this out there, because we've been working with um, some dogs with some gun sensitivity issues lately in training, and we've been utilizing not just pigeons, but some chucker in the launchers. And even if a bird is a strong flying bird, a lot of times a chucker will pop out of that launcher, and they'll pop, and they'll set down. Even if they are fully flight conditioned, healthy, ready to go, and then that dog is going to pounce in on it, and then the flush is going to happen. Yep. So, just saying. 
I like it. So once you have a dog that is pointing, uh, we're going to progress through this as you have um, scent acknowledgement. Okay. Birds in a launcher. You're going to run them crosswind. They're going to smell and turn that. Acknowledgement gives you the clear indication of when they actually smell the bird. Bird comes out of the launcher. Now, what that's doing is simulating a slightly overpressured bird. Didn't give them the opportunity to point. Didn't give them the opportunity to cruise in and try and take it out either. So we're in the state of acknowledgement and, ooh, I overpressured it. If your timing is right, it's only going to take a handful of birds for the average dog before they are trying to be sneakier. And they will stop and they will point. Then you can build off of that. Point for a second, point for five seconds, point for 20 seconds. And if you get to the point where you can allow them to point naturally, no words, no woeing, no nothing, and they stand there long enough that you can get in within gun range. So I'm saying they point at, let's say, 10 yards. You're 20 yards behind them. 30 yards is pretty close to gun range. But if you get into the distance where you can shoot the bird coming out of the launcher, that's when we would start shooting birds. But I just want to throw in there, if you are in the really early stages and your dog has acknowledged scent and you've worked through that and they are now pointing fairly steadily, naturally, those birds, you can launch that. And then as they're chasing, you can continue to condition that gunfire through blanking that bird while they're actually chasing before you actually get to the point where you are shooting birds for them that have been pointed out of the launchers. Speaking of, there's a pigeon in the window that didn't go home, apparently. Uh-oh. Because now it's dark time. It's dark 30 here, it and it is not going to no, get didn't make it. back in its homing coop. So Those are some of the new birds that it's their first times out of the loft. I remember my first time ooh, ooh, out of ooh. the loft. What does it say right there? I was, I don't know. This is... Charles Coulter, moderator. Oh, you... You can make yourself a moderator? No, I upgraded him. Upgrade. Whoop, whoop. We should have done He's that a, a long little, time ago. Got a little wrench by his name there. Wrench on it. Mm-hmm. Okay, Sarah Lucas, we are expecting a baby in the spring. Any good tips on helping introduce a baby and puppy dog to one another? Absolutely. So, we did the introduction process by holding the baby and letting the dogs come up and sniff the baby. Then I place trained my dogs until my baby was fully mobile, up, sitting confidently, and crawling confidently before the dogs were allowed to free range in the house because babies are super fragile <laughs> and um, dogs are unpredictable. And I want to make sure that my baby is safe and my dogs aren't doing anything that could p potentially hurt them. So um, though I know people that let their dogs just interact with their children from the very beginning of bringing them home, I didn't feel comfortable doing that in an unsub super unsupervised situation. So making sure that there is 100% supervision, making sure that you're right there because all it takes is a split second of your dog hearing something and running into the other room and just happening to run across your baby, which, you know, they have very delicate skin. So the nails scratching your baby or hurting them or stomping on them, anything like that um, is just too unpredictable to happen. So we made sure that through that process until the baby was a little more mobile and a little more resilient that we weren't just letting them, you know, figure it out for themselves, if you will. Yeah, the unpredictability and maybe it's just my lack of comfort with the baby itself, right? I think we were probably a little less a little less cautious with number two than with we were Kate? with number one. A with little. Aiden. A little bit. Maybe, but but it's even like a dang then, wrecking I ball though. <laughs> he's pretty solid. Um, the other thing though is we, for the most part, consider ourselves the GSP fun police, and we maintain a lot of obedience with our dogs. So they come into the house and they are expected to get on their dog beds and stay there until the excitement of the situation wears off. If we've got some of our older, more mature dogs, they get a little more leniency in, you know free range of the house through supervision and not having to constantly be on their dog bed, but any of the young dogs are constantly expected to stay on their place. 
because in those situations, they don't learn naughty things like counter surfing or jumping up on people or getting in the garbage because those aren't options when you have to be on a plate. Correct, Amundo. What is the best bird to use for training a flusher? Bassin on the elk cart. Mm -hmm. You were here early. Early, early, like 6.30, I think, you commented on there. I was sitting here waiting for people to comment so I could comment back. No, we're just getting stuff set up. The um, question with that is a bird that sits in the grass and flushes. Typically, with young dogs, we would utilize smaller birds. They're going to be less intimidating. Something like a quail or a chucker. That's it. Nothing magic here. Flushers. And something that has, you know, is healthy and going to fly well. Yeah, that's good. I would be um, probably not utilizing flusher or uh, launchers, excuse me, with flushing dogs. Put them in the grass. If they catch a few of them, great. Builds drive. They're more excited to run in there for the next one. Try and catch it. That's the whole goal. That's what they're trying to do. So this question, Chris Amundsen says, I'm willing to lose birds, but when do you shoot when he lets me flush? So if you're going into flush, the bird flushes, and your dog is actively chasing, absolutely shoot the bird. Um, I hesitate with young dogs to shoot if they aren't chasing, even if you've done a proper gunfire introduction, because we want to continue conditioning that gunfire properly and making sure that there isn't a situation that creates gun sensitivity, and if the dog isn't watching the bird, isn't actively chasing, thinking about that bird, and that level of excitement is there, and then they hear this gunfire that's, you know, a little more startling, they can definitely have some potential apprehension to that gunfire, and we wouldn't want that to cause any sensitivity issues. So I like to see an active chase when I am shooting my birds for my dogs that they've pointed. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey. Jared Corby. Hey, I hope you're enjoying watching your puppies play. Well, or one sleep. of your one of your puppies play. There's well, literally technically yeah. sleeping. Yeah. Oh, well, oh, oh, itching oh, oh, maybe. Oh, somebody who's that spunking over on? No, nope, stretching. That stretching. was stretching. Yeah. <laughs> they were trying to kill each other. They were just like. Rah rah sleep. Uh huh. Okay. Like we literally were a little concerned, honestly, about putting the two letters together, even though they're the exact same age. I wasn't sure we'd get able to get them separated again correctly. Yeah, it's hard to tell the difference. I mean, I'd be so confused. The yellow ones, they're trickiest. <laughs> so he said, I've noticed with my first GSP, Pepper, that she is very vocal, whines and whimpers when she's wanting something. Is there a way to tone this down so she is a bit more quiet? So this is something that um, dogs that are really driven a lot of times exhibit that whining because they want something they're ready to work. And typically that means a combination of things. One, that they need more. So they need more opportunities to work. Um, but also that they need opportunities to work and be rewarded when they're being calm, quiet, and patient. In regards to retrieving, for example, if you've got a dog that is consistently whining for their retrieves or getting really worked up for their retrieves, you need to work through what we call denials, where the dog doesn't get an opportunity to retrieve until they are quiet. That will help you develop a calmer, more quiet dog that is patiently, quietly waiting to make those retrieves, not getting more and more and more worked up until you're finally like, just go get it so you shut up. Yeah, so it would just kind of depend on where the vocal whining, whimpering is happening. Um, I think a lot of people with young dogs see that with crate training. Other people might specifically see that. I mean, really what it comes down to is there are such a thing as like a talker, but it depends on, depends on when it's happening, and that would help us to... <laughs> We're a mess tonight. Uh, well, Kelly... I stayed up super late last night working on that course. Like one thirty. That's not super late. Come on. What kind of old lady are you? I'm an old lady. I like to go to bed at 930. Party time. Much. The bars are just getting ready to close. What are you talking about? That's when, when you go. When was the last time you were at a bar? I don't remember. Um, You go to uh, IHOP and get breakfast. Come on. I am old. 
I'm older than you. <coughs> All right, says my my Springer catches the pigeons coming out of the out of launchers out of the grass. How are we catching pigeons? A pigeon catcher? Tell me about it. Talk to me. Fasten on the elk cart. Yeah. Holly Jenkins, I have an eight-month-old GSP, great with bigger dogs, but she will bowl over little dogs. No biting or aggressive behavior, but just running mm-hmm. into them. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a bull in a china shop type of thing to do for some uh-huh. dogs. They yeah. just don't respect other dogs, other people, things like that. Yeah, and it's more of a personality thing than anything else. We have some dogs that are really respectful, some dogs that are not, and... There is some truth between around like dog communication. If that bull in the china shop had a dog say, "Hey, that's not a respectful way to communicate," which doesn't really happen with puppies, but um, also that's a really quick way to start dog fights. So you've got some repercussions that can come out of that. Um, a lot of times, what we do is just try and help advocate for everybody involved. Hey, you don't be a turd. Hey, you don't be a pansy. Get along, right? I mean, all of it. Yeah, and importantly, that eight-month-old GSP needs to learn appropriate play and respect for other dogs, and it's our place to interrupt that inappropriate play, redirect it so that you can say, hey, I see that you're not respecting that little dog. I'm just going to recall you into a heel or recall you just to me so that you can't, you know, knock them over, that sort of thing. I like it. This is a good one from Michael K. A uh-huh. question that we get asked fairly frequently, and I've been talking to a lot of people about puppies recently, so mm. this makes me think about this question a little bit. So, Standing Stone, do you find that males are more stubborn than females when it comes to training? 100%. Ethan. No. <laughs> I'm going to fight you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... This is the age-old question, males versus females, things like that. And um, I want to answer the question with a question. Okay. Would question? you say that all men are more stubborn when it comes to learning versus all women? Or would you say that all women are more stubborn than all men? Let's start another poll. So the the point that Ethan's trying to make is that that is a very broad generalization Mm -hmm. and um, people typically make that generalization based on a small pool of dogs that they are gaining that experience through. So if you in your life have owned four or five dogs and they may or may not even be the same breed and, oh, we're getting a little more active. coming alive. Wake mm-hmm. up, puppies. Um, so those may or may not even be the same breed. They may or may not even be from the same breeder, the same lines, things like that. And so you're not actually comparing apples to apples when you're looking at what those dogs have been for you. So I've had people that say, oh, well, I've owned you know males and I've owned females, and the females always seem to you know, mature faster or be more affectionate or whatever the generalization is. And I... S- you know, explain to them that, hey, you've probably not actually, you know, been comparing apples to apples because of these, you know, X, Y, and Z. They're from different breeders. They're different breeds, things like that. And for us, we are actually able to work with a lot of dogs from our breeding program, as well as a lot of dogs from a specific breeding and so we are able to go as okay. well as a lot of dogs from different breeds and different programs and different situations. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a really broad variety of dogs as well as consistency in what we're comparing. And that allows us to make generalizations and conclusions based on comparing apples to apples. So, so if I've it comes back to the the tried and true. Everything's genetics. Yeah, and if I've got a litter of puppies and I get an opportunity to work with 70% of those puppies and it's a combination of males and females, I'm going to see the same temperaments, the same trainability, the same you know, personalities out of that entire litter. And they're going to be the same whether it's a male or a female. 
Mm-hmm. So. We've had. That was a really long way to answer your question. The answer they're is not, no. They're not more stubborn. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. It, it, it just comes down to <laughs> we've had males, we've had females that are smarter, faster, slower, and all the things. So it's just uh, each is an individual, and they typically follow their parents. So if you know what those are, bingo, bango. This is an interesting one here and probably a good one to end on. We okay. are to the time. Question, two-year-old golden retriever. Fantastic. Currently going through the legend force fetch or Trained formal, retrieve. formal retrieving work here. Um, about to start fetch, part one. I've avoided retrieving during the pr- uh, during the process to avoid bad habits. Is this smart? If not, when should I start back with normal retrieving work? He's already a fairly strong retriever. It just likes to chew. Okay, so this is a good question. It's a really, a really, really good, good question. question. Good question, Jason. Nice. Uh, question of the evening goes to... Say it. Is drum, it a drum roll, roll, please. No, I was doing the drum roll. You're supposed to answer it. Oh, Jason's story? Aha! So, um, and I don't know. It's a great question, though. So, when we are working with formal retrieving work, we're going to... Um, typically be able to continue business as usual. That's playing fetch, doing things. Unless. Here's the caveat. Here's the yep, 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 yep. If we have really bad habits or we have a dog that has no desire to retrieve, those are going to be the two times that we typically don't attempt anything outside, okay? So when you're saying choose, likes to chew. If we've got mouthing, rolling, chomping issues, it's going to be better if we can stop allowing that to be conditioned because it's a bad habit and it's a self-fulfilling thing. They're doing it because they like it. Yeah, it's satisfying, self-satisfying. There yeah. you go. Um, probably better words. They are chewing because I they want to. I always have better words than him. Always. They're My chewing. vocabulary versus your vocabulary. I lose. They're <laughs> going to chew. Words with friends. I win. Always. They're going to chew the <laughs> Have things. I talked over you enough? I mean, if you haven't checked the Ethan's getting talked over box yet, God dang it, you got a bingo. So you just start, like, once one box is used five times, you can <laughs> randomly select another one. So the, um, the biggest thing is that <laughs> that chewing, it is bad, and it's hard to work through, Okay. Um, one thing that you could do to kind of help with that would be moving to really hard retrieving objects. I found like a solid plastic that was really, really hard plastic bumper a long time ago. And I would switch to that here, chew on this, you know, you can't chew on it. It's like retrieving a rock. Okay. Um, but if you're still getting those chewing habits, you need to be working through in separate sessions only to stop the chewing so that you have a really solid handle when you go back. Okay. If it's just a little bit of rolling, a little bit of mouthing, you just need to understand that outside of the formal retrieving work sessions, you can't actually reinforce or maintain or ask anything. You need to allow whatever's happening out there to happen, and then you work in the training sessions themselves. Now, if you have a non-retriever, don't mess with it. You're just continuing to condition refusal. And we need a better understanding of the pieces so that we can kind of work to that. We get a lot of non-retrievers that is like, can you help my dog retrieve? Sure, we can. Um, you can take a non-retriever and make them pretty good-ish, kind of, some days. Um, you can take a good retriever and make them really good. Or you can take a really good retriever and make them perfect. Yeah, and the thing that... Cherry. The thing that I want to mention is anything your dog's doing, they're conditioning themselves to. Ooh. And typically we're doing, oh, puppies are all wakey, wakey, eggs and bakey. Yeah, it's about dang time. In a minute, the puppies are going to start really playing. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba. Or pooping all over the yeah, place. Yeah, they're going to need to go out <laughs> here pretty quick, guys. They're going to be like, I need a potty break, and well, then they'll start playing. Well, it was fun to watch the puppies, but it's time to get them outside to go to the bathroom because it already looks like we've got a couple accidents, so. But what I wanted to say is anything your dog's doing, they're conditioning themselves to. So anything they're doing consistently, they're conditioning themselves to. And a lot of the times, the reason that we're actually even doing a trained retrieve is because 
the dog has conditioned some naughty retrieving habits, whether that's been Likes developed. Likes to chew while running on the way back. Yep. Send me a video. Hey, you're talking over me. Yeah. Sorry about Send me a video. Play. So, so typically that's like mouthing. Is it a little distracting? Is it kind of <laughs> difficult? Yes. Uh, you do it to me a lot. That's why it's on the bingo card for you talking over me. There's a spot for you too. No, I'm pretty sure there's not because it never happens. Except for this one time at band camp. Continue. Okay. Do you remember where you were at? No. So something about anything, anything a dog's doing, doing, they're conditioning, yeah. doing consistently, they're conditioning themselves to. And... The whole reason for doing a trained retrieve a lot of times is because of these naughty habits that have been conditioned, whether that's been developed through retrieving tennis balls and that mouthing, chewing, and rolling behavior, or a lot of access to squeaky toys, or the excitement of getting the next retrieve so the dog's coming back and just spitting it at you so they can get the next retrieve. Any of those things that you are seeing being conditioned is something that we want to interrupt and eliminate, and that is via this trained retrieve process. So typically I recommend not doing more retrieving that is if your dog has these naughty habits because it's just going to be harder to uncondition them. And when you get back into those situations, the dog is going to, even though they've got all of this formal retrieving training done now, it's going to naturally want to revert back to what it has been conditioned and been doing forever and ever and ever, amen. So it would be better to find other outlets for that dog's energy through free runs and through treadmill time and other ways to exercise that dog than doing more retrieving until they are formally finished with their retrieving. Okay. I love it. Done. Done. What was our poll before we – how do I get to the poll? Uh, it's gone. <laughs> you deleted the poll? Yeah, I got rid of it. That wasn't very helpful. 41% said $250, 31% said $500, 13% said $1,000. Also $1 million doll hairs for 13%. Hey, Perfect. oh, I'll take it. Okay. Well, thank you guys for your input. I like it. And we're in the vicinity of what we were thinking. Now, um, the, the last and not least is on our upcoming trip, Kat and I are getting the opportunity to go north mm. to Alaska. Not quite that far north, but... Together, we actually get to hunt together. And what I am most excited for, probably, I would say, is the ability to be on the prairie, grilling on my Traeger that is mounted inside my dog trailer. <laughs> That's what you're most excited for? Yeah, we've got the little pre-made patties that are frozen. We're going to take those I bad know, boys. I am excited for the whole experience. Flip like them out really on the fun. old Traeger grill and then bing, bang, boom. We've got a little slider drawer that... Pulls out, be sitting there in the lawn chairs under the old awning, chilling in the shade, sipping on a Rockin beer. Rocking to some music in the speakers. Rocking to some music. Bye. And if you had been on the last trip, you would understand that we only listen to one country artist. If you can name that artist, I will give you a million doll hairs. Hold on. I want a million doll hairs. Parker McCollum. Uh, no. Oh. Sorry. We just went to him at the state fair, so that's, that's why really I was cool. going with that one. Mm -hmm. Any bingos? Any bingo bangos? Mm. Oh, oh, wait, what's this one? Yep. Yep. Did we talk about that? Stuff. What is what was that one? I don't remember talking about that. I don't think we did talk about that. Mm. Nope. Hmm. Sad day. Nope. 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 No nope, bingo nope. bangos this week. None. What happened? There was one, I thought. Nope. Nope. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Sorry. Sorry. What? What's up? Oh, oh rock and roll. Oh, precious. All right, folks. Um, I'm going to give the signal, and there you're going to get to watch them steal all of the puppies to take them outside.
but they are stinking cute. Finally, this is what we had wanted for this last hour. Mm-hmm. Puppies, you can't figure out their, you know, sleeping schedules quite yet. They're all over the place. They pretty much play until they're exhausted and then sleep until they're awake and then play until they're exhausted and then sleep until they're awake and then eat in between there as well. Excellent. Well, folks, with that, we're going to leave you the last couple minutes here. You can watch the puppies play until they get picked up and hauled away. But uh, Kat and I are signing off. I'm the guy with the pink gun. I'm Kat the dog trainer. We'll see you in the next video and enjoy some puppy playtime for the next few minutes.